distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters young friends from schools and colleges and domestic workers a very good morning to all of you on behalf of the united nations it is my great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to you in today's in the scope auditorium at the outset i thank you for joining us on this wonderful saturday morning for this public lecture which is being organized as part of un public series uh, today's lecture on the invisible workers rights justice and dignity for domestic workers is also being webcast through the one un website and the undp website and i also welcome the audience who have joined us through the internet नमस्कार आप सबको संयुक्त राष्ट्र की तरफ से हार्दिक स्वागत है आज के इस पब्लिक लेक्चर सीरीज में ये जो आज का पब्लिक लेक्चर सीरीज है ये घरेलू कामगार के ऊपर है और आज इस लेक्चर को सुनने के लिए हमारे पास अलग अलग जगह से लोग आए हैं विभिन्न भारत सरकार के ऑफिसर्स हैं बड़े उच्च पदाधिकारी हैं मजदूर संगठन है नागरिक समाज के लिए जो कार्यकर्ता है वो सब है सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस है स्कूल और कॉलेजेस के छात्र छात्राएं भी हैं और सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट हमारे साथ आज घरेलू कामगार भी हैं जो हमारे घरों में काम करते हैं मैं आप सबका आज इस पब्लिक लेक्चर सीरीज में स्वागत करती हूँ इससे पहले कि हम मैं चाहूंगी कि अब स्टेज पे इनवाइट करना चाहती हूँ मिस लिस ग्रांडे को मिस लिस ग्रांडे प्लीज मिस टीनस टेमोस एंड प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर जयति घोष कार्यक्रम शुरू करने से पहले मैं एक एक छोटी सी दुखद खबर भी आपको देना चाहती हूँ प्रोफेसर जी के चड्डा जो वाइस प्रेसिडेंट थे साउथ एशिया यूनिवर्सिटी के और ज्वाला नेहरू यूनिवर्सिटी के पहले वो वाइस चांसलर भी रह चुके हैं एक बहुत ही एमिनेंट स्कॉलर और एक एडमिशन कल रात को उनका देहांत हो गया है बिफोर वी बिगिन दिस प्रोग्राम आई ऑल्सो वॉन्ट टू इन्फॉर्म यू विद प्रोफाउंड ग्रीफ दट प्रोफेसर जी के चड्डा who is the president who is the president of the south asia university and the former vice chancellor of the jawala nehru university passed away last night so before we begin uh, the program today may i request all of you to pay uh, your tribute by observing a minute of silence aap sab ki taraf se main chahti hu ki hum ek minute ka maun rakhkar unko shraddhanjali de professor ji ke chadha ko aap sab khade honge धन्यवाद थैंक यू टूडेज प्रोग्राम इज अबाउट डोमेस्टिक वर्कर्स डोमेस्टिक वर्कर्स द वन हु क्लीन योर डिशेस वॉश योर क्लोथ्स टेक केयर ऑफ योर चिल्ड्रन एंड द एल्डरली एंड वेन यू आर एट वर्क और स्पेंडिंग टाइम विद योर फ्रेंड्स एंड द फैमिली दे आर देयर विद योर लव एंड न्यू वंस we are happy that today in this audience we have not only you the employers of domestic workers but also the domestic workers themselves aaj ki sabha mein gharelu kamgar jo hamare har taraf hamesha hamari madad ke liye aage rehte hain wo sab yahan pe maujood hain jo hamare ghar mein kapde dhote kapde dhote hain bartan saaf karte hain hamare bachcho ka dhyan rakhte hain 
हमारे गुरु का भी ध्यान रखते हैं जब हम काम पे जाते हैं जब हम अपने दोस्तों के साथ बैठे होते हैं तो हमारे घरेलू कामगार दोस्त ही हमारी मदद करते हैं और आज ये प्रोग्राम आप सभी के लिए है हम सभी के लिए है आज इस प्रोग्राम को शुरुआत करने के लिए मैं इनवाइट करूंगी मिस लिस लिसे ग्रैंड को मिस लिसे ग्रैंड जो है वो संयुक्त राष्ट्र की निर्देशिका है इस भारत वर्ष के लिए और उन्होंने बहुत काम किया है विभिन्न विभिन्न देशों में काम करा है उन्नीस सौ से वो यूएन के साथ जुड़ी हुई है और संयुक्त राष्ट्र के सबसे बड़े माननीय कार्यों में और शांति मिशन में भी उन्होंने पहल करी है मिसलिस ग्रांडे को आमंत्रित करूंगी मैं अभी आपसे कुछ दो शब्द कहेंगी वो मिस लिसे ग्रांड इज द यू एन रेजिडेंट कोऑर्डिनेटर एंड यू एन पी यू एन पी पी रेजिडेंट रिप्रेजेंटेटिव इन इंडिया लिसे हैज वर्क फॉर द यूनाइटेड नेशन सिंस नाइनटीन सर्विंग इन आर्मेनिया अंगोला डेमोक्रेटिक रिपब्लिक ऑफ कॉन्गो ईस्ट मोर हेती Occupied Palestine, South Sudan, and Tajikistan. She has also been involved in some of the United Nations' largest humanitarian operations and has also served in the peacekeeping missions. I invite you to say a few words. Thank you. Allow me to start by paying my respects to the colleagues on the podium, Professor Ghosh, my very good friend Tini, and to greet all of you. As the head of the 27 United Nations agency funds and programs that have the privilege of working in India, I'm honored to welcome you to the United Nations public lecture on the invisible workers, rights, justice, and dignity for domestic workers. It is my pleasure to warmly welcome Jayatri Ghosh, the professor of economics at JNU University. Professor Ghosh is one of India's leading voices on the rights of marginalized and underprivileged populations. In addition to authoring several books and many articles on development and decent work, Professor Ghosh is a columnist for several Indian journals and newspapers, including Frontline Magazine, Business Line, The Deccan Chronicle, and Asian Age. Professor Ghosh was a member of the National Knowledge Commission, a high-level advisory body to the Prime Minister, and she is the Executive Secretary of the International Development Economics Association. Dr. Ghosh has been a co-recipient of the International Labor Organization's Decent Work Research Prize for major scholarly contributions to the analysis of decent work in the context of globalization, as well as the interlinkages between employment, gender, and development. Dr. Ghosh was the principal author of the West Bengal Human Development Report, which received UNDP's prize for excellence in analysis. Professor Ghosh is closely involved with a range of progressive organizations and social movements in India and beyond. It's a tremendous honor, Professor Ghosh, that you will be delivering the UN public lecture on the rights of domestic workers. As we all know, Domestic workers are among the most vulnerable workers in India. They endure poor working conditions, they are frequently exploited, and their basic rights are routinely violated. Many domestic workers are migrants, either from other countries or from within India, and because of this are routinely denied access to their basic entitlements. Children working as domestics are particularly vulnerable. They are often given little or no pay. They are exposed to physical, sexual, and psychological violence, and in many cases, they are deprived of their right to care, to education, to recreation, to rest, to their rights of childhood. In 2011, the International Labor Conference adopted the Convention on Decent Work for Domestic Workers. For the first time globally, the Convention established a comprehensive labor standard for domestic workers consistent with the same basic labor rights available to other workers. 
Domestic workers under the convention are entitled to work reasonable hours. They are entitled to have a weekly rest of at least 24 consecutive hours. They are entitled to have clear information on the terms and conditions of their employment, and they are entitled to enjoy the fundamental principles and rights at work, including freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining. While India has not yet ratified the convention, steps are being taken to ensure that the rights of domestic workers are respected. The government of India has formulated a draft national policy on domestic workers that includes specific sections that protect domestic workers, including their rights to organize themselves in trade unions. Initiatives are underway to include domestic workers under the ambent of labor laws, including the Sexual Harassment Act and Unorganized Workers Act, and the government has prohibited domestic child labor for children under 14. Several state governments are taking steps to improve working conditions for domestic workers and to provide access to social security schemes. Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Karnataka, Kerala, Orisha, and Rajasthan have all introduced minimum wages for domestic workers. And Kerala, Maharashtra, and Tamil Nadu have established welfare boards for domestic workers to help ensure that they receive their benefits. The United Nations believes that all workers, all workers, including domestic workers, have the right to fair terms of employment. Our global strategy, led by the International Labor Organization, ILO, aims to strengthen the national institutions concerned with labor rights to promote the ratification and implementation of labor conventions, including the 2011 Domestic Workers Convention, and to raise awareness about labor exploitation on the one hand and labor's contribution to global prosperity on the other. We are honored that today one of India's leading intellectuals is here to educate us on this most important of issues. Professor Ghosh, you are very welcome. Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you, Tina. For me, it's really a huge honor and privilege to be invited to deliver this lecture. And I feel particularly honored that with this audience. I feel uh, that I'm in the company of people who actually know much more about this issue than I do. And I feel really greatly honored to have this chance to talk to all of you. First of all, I would like to say that it's a very bad thing that I have been here. But if you look at me, I would like to say more than that that we have a chance to talk to you because I think that this is what we have to do in our lives every time इसको एक्सपीरियंस करते हैं उनके साथ ये वाली बातें करने के लिए हमारा एक बहुत गर्व की बात है सो थैंक यू टू ऑल माय सिस्टर्स एंड अदर्स ऑल ऑफ यू हियर एंड आई रियली डू बिलीव दैट इन फैक्ट दिस पर्टिकुलर इनिशिएटिव ऑफ ब्रिंगिंग out into public view, the issues that concern domestic workers is something that is so essential for our economy and for our society that I am delighted to see this kind of turnout and this kind of awareness. You know, it's true that we've had recently some very public uh, and very high profile incidents that relate to domestic workers. And that in a sense is good because that has brought into public view something that is very commonly swept under the carpet or ignored or not really taken into consideration in India. We've had the infamous uh, case of Devyani Khobra Gade versus Sangeeta Richards, which was a case in fact between two Indian citizens. But it very quickly became an issue of national pride versus US double standards, diplomacy, all kinds of other things entered into this thing. When fundamentally, in fact, it was really a case about the attitudes of private employers to the rights and dignity of the employed. Similarly, we've had horrific instances uh, in our national capital, in one of the most privileged posh areas, in a bungalow belonging to a minister. We've had the case of a migrant woman who actually died because of the physical abuse and torture suffered at the hands of her employer who was in fact the wife of an elected representative of the country. Now, 
these cases, when they get this high-profile attention, they are certainly covered in the media, and there is shock and horror. But then the media is quickly to, it's quick to say that, you know, all employers are not bad. That's obvious, of course, all employers are not bad. I think a lot of the public discussion has missed the basic point that this is, should not be about whether employers are good or bad. It should not, should not be about whether, you know, uh, you have, there are individual employers who display generosity. In other words, what we have to recognize is that w domestic workers are not just human beings, but they are workers with all the rights that all other workers in our country have, and that this must be, what we must demand is the social recognition of those rights and that dignity. And it cannot be the will of a private employer or the generosity of a private employer that determines that. जो बातचीत चल रही है वो जो बेजानी खोबरागाड़ी केस ये थी या जो वो जो एमपी की बीबी का घर में जो एक देहांत हो गया उनके बारे में जो मीडिया कहते आए हैं कि हाँ ये बहुत बुरी बात है ये बहुत खराब है मगर सारे तो एम्प्लॉयर्स ऐसे नहीं होते हैं कुछ अच्छे भी हैं कुछ भले भी हैं हमारा यही कहना है कि सबसे पहले हमें ये मानना चाहिए कि ये कौन अच्छा है कौन बुरा है इसको लेकर बात नहीं है बात ये है कि हक जो है जो घरेलू काम करने वाले के जो हक है उनको हमें मानना है समाज की तरफ से ये मानना है और ये किसी एक एम्प्लॉयर की भले होने की नाते होना ये बात ठीक नहीं है ये जो काम करने वाले श्रमिक के जो हक है उसको समाज की तरफ से मानना चाहिए ये जरूरी है so I think the first thing we have to recognize is that you know domestic work, the reason why we undervalue it is also related to the attitudes that we have towards social reproduction in an economy generally. It's not just in India, it's in a number of other countries, but I think in India it's extreme the way we look at issues of social reproduction. Because domestic work, you know, the whole range of work that is done within families and households and sometimes even within communities makes a huge contribution to the economy. Not just to society, not just to the comfort of people's lives, but to the economy. And this is something that we don't recognize. And that's why it's not measured properly, properly, we don't recognize it, and a large part of it is unpaid. But you know, in fact, no society would survive, not for, forget the next generation, even in the current generation, without this massive contribution made by domestic work paid or unpaid domestic work. It is absolutely essential for social reproduction and in fact it contributes hugely to what we call the national income even when it is not recognized as doing that. So one of the problems is in fact that in India we don't recognize this huge role that is played by social reproduction which is to say not just the care economy, the looking after the young, the old, the sick, but all of the tasks related to household reproduction, enabling every person in that family to function on a daily basis, all the tasks related to what are called, you know, household uh, indirect income, that is things that you do within the household to save money for purchasing those things, all of those are actually huge contributors, not just to that individual family's welfare, but to the economy. हमारी जो डिस्कशन चलती है उसमें हम ये साफ साफ नहीं देखते हैं कि ये जो घरेलू काम है ये आर्थिक व्यवस्था के लिए बहुत जरूरी है हम ये नहीं देखते कि ये जीडीपी का एक बहुत बड़ी हिस्सा है कंट्रीब्यूटर है क्योंकि हम इसको गिनते नहीं हैं हम इसका पूरा एस्टीमेशन नहीं करते हैं तो इस इसलिए हम समझ भी नहीं पाते कि ये कितना बड़ा कंट्रीब्यूशन है हमारे समाज के लिए नाउ इन फैक्ट बिकॉज ऑफ दिस बिकॉज ऑफ द फैक्ट दैट वी टेंड टू अंडर वैल्यू इट and because so much of it in fact in India is unpaid, there is often a direct relationship between how you recognize domestic work and the situation of women in that society. Because it is also true that most domestic work is performed by women, both paid and unpaid. We do have time use surveys that now tell us the contribution of women and approximately it's about 70% of the unpaid labor time is performed by women within a household. So slightly more than two-thirds of the time is goes by women. So it's not only women, it's also men. 
but definitely women are the dominant contributors in the unpaid activities of a household. But we tend not to recognize it. We don't value it at all. We underestimate it. We don't see the fact that most women are actually working. In India, officially, we have the lowest labor participation rates among many, many developing countries, certainly among all the BRICS countries, all the G20 countries. And what is remarkable is that we have low labor force participation, which is declining. Yet, in fact, that doesn't actually fit with what we know, which is that most women are actually working. When you look around you, you will find that most women are, and I'm sure every woman in this audience knows this, that most women are working. And the paid work is only a small part of that work. Now, in fact, this decline in the labor force participation is quite remarkably, it's inversely related to the amount of unpaid work that is done. And how do we know this? Because, in fact, our national sample surveys do ask about other activities that are performed in the household, which they don't call work. It would become work if you paid for it, but it's not called work when it's unpaid, which is a whole range of things. It's, um, it's for example, all the tasks of looking after children, taking care of the sick and elderly, preparing food, all home management, cooking, cleaning, etc. All the expenditure saving activities like maintaining kitchen gardens and orchards, taking care of household poultry and cattle, collecting firewood, collecting water, grinding food grains, pre preparing cow dung cakes, making baskets and mats, sewing, tailoring, weaving, tutoring, all of these. Even when women do this, they're not called workers. This is not seen as work if it is unpaid. When it is paid, then yes, they are identified as workers. But because so much of this is performed by women who are not paid, society tends to undervalue it in general. So, there are many things that are very important that we have to do without it. This is what we have to do. We have to do it in our homes and without it. We have to do it in our homes. We have to do it in our homes. We have to do it in our homes. तो घर पे जो जो काम ये सारे जो जरूरी काम होती है उनके लिए वेतन न होने के कारण ये समाज मानता भी नहीं है कि ये काम है तो जब हमारे सर्वे आते हैं पूछते हैं तो वो बोलते हैं कि ये काम करती नहीं है घर पे रहती है काम जो करते हैं उनको देखते ही नहीं है बस ये तो घर में रहती है ये बाहर काम नहीं करती है तो ये काम ही नहीं माना जाता है सो बिकॉज वी अंडर वैल्यू ऑल ऑफ दिस डोमेस्टिक वर्क एंड इट्स क्रूशल रोल in the economy, we also undervalue even the paid workers who do it. Because we don't know how to do it, when we work for money, we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to do it in the eyes of the society, that this is a very important work, and what we do, this is also a necessary work, and they also need a necessary work, and they also need a necessary work. We don't think about it, because जो करते हैं अपने घरों में महिलाएं हो या लड़कियां हो या जो भी हैं उनको तो हम पैसे नहीं देते हैं तो जो भी हम बाकी देते हैं उनको हम कम कम ही देते हैं क्योंकि हम सोचते हैं कि ये तो असली काम नहीं है ना दिस पर्टिकुलर इश्यू इट रियली इज एक्चुअली अ रिफ्लेक्शन ऑफ द लो स्टेटस ऑफ वुमेन इन सोसाइटी बट इट रिप्रोड्यूस दैट लो स्टेटस Because of the fact that we have women who do not get the same kinds of opportunities outside because they are forced to work at home. In fact, the same NSS surveys tell us that around 55% of the women who are doing only these activities are doing it because there's no one else in the house to do it. You are, they're asked, why are you doing this? They're saying, because someone has to do it. This, this work has to be done and there's no one else. And therefore, they're not available for outside work. Similarly, in fact, the same women who also go for outside work, somebody has to do that work at home. So they are doing the double burden of working outside and working at home. And not only is the working outside as domestic work undervalued, but the working inside the home for that domestic work is not recognized at all. It is zero valued. So these people who work in their homes, they work in their homes, आधा से ज्यादा महिलाएं जब पूछा जाता है सर्वेज में वो बोलते हैं कि हाँ हमें करना है क्योंकि और कोई है नहीं घर में करने के लिए तो कौन करेगा हम ही करते हैं तो ये जो अपने घरों में काम करते हैं ये तो माना नहीं जाता है कि काम है फिर भी क्योंकि ये करना ही है इसीलिए वो बाहर काम नहीं कर पाते हैं या जा भी नहीं सकते कौन करेगा ये सब जो घर में काम है और इसीलिए भी 
ان کو یہ بھی کہتے ہیں کہ جو پچپن سے زیادہ بولتے ہیں کہ ہمیں یہ اور ہمیں کرنا ہے تو ہم اور کہیں کام نہیں کر پائیں گے اور گھر میں اور کوئی ہے نہیں بھی یہ کرنے کے لیے اور جب یہ عورتیں نکلتے بھی ہیں رشش کر کے گریب گھروں میں سے جب عورتیں نکلتے بھی ہیں باہر کام کرنے کے لیے مانی جو اور کسی کے گھر میں یہی کام گھرے لوگ کام ہی کرنے کے لیے ان کو گھر میں واپس آکے خود بھی وہی کام کرنا پڑتا ہے بنا پیسے کی اور وہ مانا نہیں جاتا ہے کہ وہ ضروری کام ہے کیونکہ اس میں بہتن آتا نہیں ہے so as I said this is a reflection of the broader situation of women in the economy and that's why the issue of domestic work even though the total proportion of domestic workers in India is less female than in many other countries across the world it's about 85% of domestic workers are women in India it's only just under 60% it's about 57% so it, we don't have such a large proportion of women workers but most of the increase in, in fact in the last decade has been of women so 75% of the increase in women's uh, in domestic workers in the last decade has been female and also a, about 30% of all the increase in women's work especially in urban India in the last decade has been in domestic work so this is true that in our country there are a lot of women in our country کم سے کم سے کم ساٹھ پرتیشت کے آس پاس ساٹھ فیصدی ہے پھر بھی پچھلے دس سال میں جو زیادہ سے زیادہ بڑھتی ہوئی ہے ڈومیسٹک ورک میں وہ مہیلاؤں میں ہیں پچھتر پرتیشت مہیلاؤں کی ہے اور جو مہیلاؤں کی جو روزگاری ہے مہیلاؤں کی جو ایمپلائیمنٹ ہے وہ کم سے کم تیس پیتیس پرتیشت یہی گھرے لکام میں ہی ہوا ہے So it is becoming more and more important in the economy as a form of paid work. So then the next question is, okay, why is paid work of, in the form of domestic work increasing so much in India? And this too is related to what is happening in the economy as a whole. So when you look at the last 10 years, well really the last 12 years, between 2009-10 and 2011-12, which is when we have the data, what you find is that overall there's a decline in women's workforce participation, or very low growth in most states, but there is a very significant increase in women as domestic workers. Now, what's going on? How is this happening? I would argue that it's reflecting two very related forces. One is the fact that we are just not, as an economy, generating enough employment opportunities. We've had years of very dramatic rapid growth, okay? We are seen as this globe, or we were seen until maybe last year, as this huge global tiger that is emerging on the world scene. We are a member of the BRICS. We are going to become the second, third largest economy quite soon. We see ourselves as this big economy that is, you know, entering 21st century and will be one of the important economic players of the 21st century with very rapid GDP growth, income growth. On the other hand, employment growth has been disastrous. Formal employment, that is employment with any kind of protection, hasn't grown at all. It's flat, zero growth over the last decade. Informal employment is now around 96% of total employment. 96% of workers are informal, of which more than around two-thirds of them are self-employed because they cannot even find employers. And most of the others are employed in casual contracts. In regular work, the biggest form, you see the way we define regular work is not that it is protected, formal, and legal. The way our data defines regular work is just what do you do every day. In regular work, the biggest increase for women in urban India is domestic work. That's the form of dynamic increase in employment that is going on. And for the other kinds of work, so one of the big things that is happening is that domestic work is really one of the only options available for employment because our economy is simply not generating enough good quality jobs. Therefore, people have no choice but to go and look for domestic work, not only women, also men, but dominantly women. Also because women are willing to work for less, they're willing to work part-time, they're willing to accept worse working conditions, all of those reasons. 
The second big reason is inequality. Because this is a period when this massive growth has really accrued to, broadly speaking, the top 10% of the population. And also, if you're looking at the income shares, dominantly to the capitalists rather than to the workers. If you look at the share of workers in what we call value added, it's falling continuously over the last decade. In manufacturing, it's really now less than 10%, when it was about 18% just 15 years ago. And so there is significant increase in profits, rent, interest, decline in self-employed incomes and wage incomes at the aggregate level. Inequality in terms of consumption, which is all, all the data we have, we know is high and is increasing, but we also know that that's an underestimate because our sample surveys, they don't go and survey the homeless. They don't go and survey the people in the poorest bastis. They don't go and survey Mr. Rambani either. So you don't get the richest and the poorest in these. So what happens with increased inequality is that you get both more and more people whose incomes are desperate and have to be supplemented through any kind of work and domestic work as I said is one of the few things that is available and on the other side you have more and more people who are able to hire domestic workers it's not just the very rich it is also the new middle class that is emerging and the new middle class is able to hire more and more domestic work because of the fact that this inequality permits very low levels of wages for these domestic workers and it allows women in these professional middle class groups to actually go out and work because they can hire domestic workers. I am a beneficiary of that. I am able to be here talking to you today because I am able to hire people who will cook and clean and do all of those things in my household for me. So, this is Now, this is remarkably something which is true across almost all the states of India. If you look at that data, you will find that there is a decline or a stagnation or almost no growth in women's employment of all kinds, not counting the domestic work that they do in their own homes that is unpaid. But there is a significant increase in all of these states in the rate of growth of domestic work. And this is not just true in North India, South India, it's true everywhere. And it's really quite a remarkable feature. What we're also finding is that more and more of this is also migrant women. This was not, I mean, this was always the case. That is to say that migration is associated with you know, survival strategies with desperation of very poor households. There have been regions that have sent migrants, particularly, for example, let's say Jharkhand women coming to Delhi, and you know, so that women in the outer regions of Vidhar going to, to Mumbai, etc., etc. But now you find that this a significant increase in the migration of domestic workers, also always of a particular age. So this 
this also creates another set of problems because migrant women, as Lisa has already mentioned, face particular vulnerabilities. It's bad enough when you are already locally resident, but you have your own networks, you have some protection, you have perhaps extended family people you know. Often migrant women, especially young women, often children. And the line between trafficking and voluntary migration is a very thin line. Because families that are desperate or situations of extreme poverty, you can't really make that distinction. That have you been trafficked, kidnapped, or did you go on your own? Children, especially 15 years plus, they're still children, really. And women up to the age of 30, there is a significant increase in this migration for domestic work. And this reflects part of the inequality I already told you about, but also regional inequality. Some sectors, some, some centers of dynamism, the national capital region is a center of dynamism in that sense. And some areas which are extremely backward, extremely undeveloped, and facing more and more fragile agriculture, more and more fragile existence because of loss of forest access, common property resources, loss of land to mining, all kinds of things. So you find that there has been a significant increase also in migration for domestic work. And as I said, migrant workers have really particular vulnerabilities. They are much more vulnerable even than local, farm, uh, local domestic workers. So, to Jaisa Makere Thiki, पिछले दस साल में तो घरेलू काम में बढ़ावत हुआ है और उसमें जो माइग्रेंट जो बाहर से आने वाले काम करने वाले उनके हिस्सा और भी बड़ा है और इसका भी ये एक कारण है कि कुछ कुछ इलाके हैं कुछ कुछ जगह हैं जहां पे काफी जीडीपी की बढ़त आयु की बढ़त हो रही है जैसे दिल्ली के शहर मुंबई शहर वगैरह वगैरह हैदराबाद शहर और कुछ इलाके हैं जहां पे कुछ हो ही नहीं रहा है बल्कि और भी मुश्किल हो जा रहा है और भी कठिन हो जा रहा है जिंदगी चलानी नहीं कठिनाई आ रही है क्योंकि एक तो ये माइनिंग कंपनी आके जमीन ले लेंगे या जो काम पहले कृषि का काम जो करते थे किसान के को चलाना के उसी बत आ गए हैं किसी बहुत सारे कारणों के लिए अपनी लड़कियों को भेजने को तैयार हैं कभी कहते हैं कि जाओ पांच साल काम कर लो अपनी दावरी लेके वापस आ जाओ कभी ऐसे बहुत सारे बढ़ गया है पहले से और जो कॉन्फ्लिक्ट जोन है उनमें से भी बहुत महिलाएं आ रहे हैं क्योंकि वहां पे और भी आर्थिक समस्याएं मिला जाते हैं वो राजनीतिक और दूसरी जो कॉन्फ्लिक्ट वाली बात होती है सो वी ऑल्सो हैव माइग्रेशन इंक्रीजिंगली फ्रॉम कॉन्फ्लिक्ट जोन्स ऑल ऑफ दीज आर सजेस्टेड नॉट जस्ट बाय केस स्टडीज एंड सो ऑन बट इवन बाय आवर नेशनल सैंपल सर्वे डेटा सो थिंग्स आर नॉट पर्टिक्युलरली ग्रेट एज यू कैन सी इन टर्म्स ऑफ द कंडीशन ऑफ डोमेस्टिक वर्क बट what is really also surprising is that despite the fact that there is such a significant increase, despite the fact that the economy is so dependent on it, despite the fact that we find this has become the most dynamic employer, we really have not got the social recognition of it and we haven't had adequate mobilization to ensure the rights and the dignity and the social, uh, shall we say, the social support for domestic work. That's why I'm so happy that the ILO and the UN have chosen this as an important theme because really it is something that the elite in our country, the middle class in our country, we do not wish to recognize because we are the employers for the change. It's fine to talk about it when it is somebody else out there and you can say, oh, well, you know, uh, Reliance has done the following things or so-and-so company has done the following things. When we are the employers and we therefore bear that responsibility, there is much less willingness among the elite and the middle class to accept the significance of the rights and the significance of the contribution to the economy. I think it's important therefore to see what can be done. We can always you know, go on about how terrible things are, and they are, of course, terrible. But we have to look at what we can do about it. And in fact, there is a lot that can be done. Lee's mentioned 
the ILO domestic, the Convention on Domestic Work. And in fact, it's very important for India to ratify it. Already, I think 15 countries have either ratified or promised to ratify it. And several others have said they will try and bring domestic laws into accordance with the convention. But supposing we did do it, supposing we actually ratified the convention, what would it mean? Let me just tell you what it would mean. It means, as she pointed out, you would have to respect, protect, and recognize the fundamental principles and rights to work of all these free workers. What does that mean? It means freedom of association, trade unions, for example. So, if we have the ILO Convention, we have to say that 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 we have Eliminating all forced or compulsory labor. Abolishing child labor. It's true, we have actually, legally now, we have included it since 2006 in the list of occupations that children cannot engage in. But I think all of us know that we don't really implement this. I think many of us have seen young people in the kitchens, in the, you know, in the tea shops, in, in various places who are effectively doing this kind of thing. Eliminating discrimination. It would require protection against all forms of abuse, harassment, and violence. This is very important. We recognize this only when there are really terrible cases, like the death of that worker. But the same case where this woman died, in that same household, there were others who said they had been systematically beaten for five or six years. And there are many, many cases that do not come to light, of systematic or even sporadic violence, abuse of different kinds, denial of food, locking up in rooms, various kinds of punishment. So, ye jo, um, bhoot saare kisim ki jo punishments hote hain, saare mana ho jate hain. Khana ne dena, kamre ne band kar dena, maana to bilkul hi, vagera vagera, ye saare bhi ek dam allowed nahi hote. Decent living conditions, fair terms of employment, we still actually allow living people to have a mat on the floor in different rooms. We don't insist that they must be given their own private space with their own privacy. There are still many middle class homes, even in my own campus, I must confess, where the domestic living worker is simply allotted a, a sort of, you know, a, not even a bed, sometimes a mat or a belly that they roll out in the room. Um, it would mean that they must be informed of the terms and conditions of employment in an easily understandable way. In fact, ideally through a written contract. So, this means that the people who are doing the work, they will tell them to tell them first that this is the work, 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 and in the written form, so that it can also be said that this is the work, this is the work, this is the work, this is the work. It would mean minimum wages, if these are defined for other workers. It would mean that the worker must be paid in cash maximum every month. And that you cannot deduct the fees of employment agencies, which many households still do. We have to a placement agency, we have to pay some money, we have to pay some money, we have to pay some money, we have to pay some money. This will not happen. No in-kind payment except only as a very limited proportion. There are people who say, we'll give you a ha a, the place to live. And so that's equivalent to so much rent. So therefore we won't pay you that much salary. The living workers must be given space that is not defined as the equivalent of rent. That's also part of this convention. It means that if you're giving food, that doesn't mean you cannot give money. It means that if you're giving other services, and for example, uniforms, protective equipment, and so on, these are all part of the job and the duties of the employer. So, sari jo kaam ke liye jo suvidhai hain, jo zaruri hain, unko bhi employer ka kaam hai ye sab dena. Ye matlab gharelu kaam wali ko dena hai, ye baat galat hai. 
it would mean that you have to have normal hours of work, overtime pay, weekly rest, as she mentioned, one day, we, uh, uh, and annual paid leave. I, as a worker in a university, I expect my leave. I would be outraged if I don't get my annual leave and my weekend and all kinds of other holidays. I expect only so many hours of work. Yet, the people who work in homes are often not even given a day off. They have to work seven days a week. They are not given, or when they are given leave for a month, it is seen as a special gift of the employer. Or when they are allowed to go and visit a sick relative, that is, you know, it's, it's all seen as a gift of the employer, rather than as a right of the worker. So, this is what is happening in the world. In the world, हफ्ता में एक दिन पूरा छुट्टी और काम के जो घंटे होते हैं वो भी गिन गिन के और अगर आठ घंटा से ज्यादा हो गया उसके लिए ओवर टाइम का पैसा ये सारे इसमें हैं इस कन्वेंशन में कि ये सारे देना जरूरी है इट्स आल्सो वेरियस थिंग्स लाइक यू नो दी द टाइम व्हेन यू हैव टू बी on call or what are called standby hours. If you remember, this was one of the issues that Sangeeta Richard complained about. That even if the work on a particular day was eight hours, she had to be available 24 hours. She could be woken up early in the morning, uh, had to work till late at night, could be called at any time. So the time that the worker has to be available also has to be regulated. ये जो होता है ना जो घर में रहने रहते हैं उनको बोलते हैं कि कभी भी आ जाओ सुबह चाय दे दो फिर रात तक कोई घर पे आ गया तो बर्तन बर्तन धो के तभी सोना ये जो है इसका भी रेगुलेशन होना चाहिए अगर इतना ज्यादा है तो फिर उसके लिए भी ओवर टाइम देना पड़ेगा दे ऑल्सो मस्ट हैव दी द फ्रीडम टू डिसाइड वेदर दे गोट टू लिव इन द हाउस होल्ड और आउट साइड दे डोंट दे कैन नॉट बी फोर्स्ड टू लिव इन द हाउस होल्ड There are measures for occupational safety and health. There are measures for social security. This is a very important thing. Most domestic workers have no social security. They don't get maternity benefit. They don't get anything, really. They have um, no kinds of the minimum social security and forget about after pension kinds of benefits. So, this social security is convention in this convention. ये घरेलू काम वालों के लिए ये भी इंतजाम होना चाहिए कि उनको ये सारा मिले और मैटर्निटी बेनिफिट भी कि कम से कम तीन महीने छुट्टी वगैरह ये सब है इसमें देर ऑल्सो ए वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट प्रोविजन देर आर देर आर प्रोविजन फॉर माइग्रेंट वर्कर्स देर इज अनदर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट प्रोविजन फॉर फेयर एक्सेस टू लीगल एंड अदर डिस्प्यूट सेटलमेंट बिकॉज दैट वन ऑफ द थिंग्स वी नो दैट इफ देर इज इन फैक्ट अ प्रॉब्लम Not only is it very hard to prove, but the power relations are so skewed against domestic workers that it is really very, very difficult for them to get justice. So, ये जो कानूनी बात है, मान लीजिए ये कानून हो भी गया, तो इसको इंप्लीमेंट करने के लिए और मान लीजिए कि किसी एम्प्लॉयर ने नहीं दिया ये सारे हक, तो फिर इस झगड़ा को आगे ले जाने के लिए भी तो सुविधा होना चाहिए. So, all of these things are there. In, these, in this convention. You can see that if we actually do sign this convention and if we actually do seek to implement it, this is a revolution in the relationship between employers and employees in Indian homes. This is actually, it would be a complete transformation in the way that domestic workers are treated. Which is why also it is going to be a tough thing to implement and it's going to be a tough thing to pass this law. Which is why the, the, the story we have so far is that very few states have done anything about domestic workers. Some states, I think there are five states, have allowed domestic workers into the minimum wage provisions. Some states like Kerala have passed a domestic wage bill which regulates hours of work for part-time workers and so on. But in general, we really do not have legal provisions for any of these things. But we also all know that legal provisions are not enough. We know that we have lots of laws and minimum wage laws nobody implements. Even the government of India doesn't want to implement minimum wage laws. You know, it, it does public works where it's trying to bypass the minimum wage laws. So it's not enough to have a minimum wage law or even a domestic workers law, which for example has already been proposed. Not yet tabled but been proposed. It, will, it is necessary 
and it is important but it is not enough तो मान लीजिए कानून हो भी गया होना चाहिए ये लड़ाई है आसानी से तो नहीं होगा आपको मालूम ही है क्योंकि ऐसे कानून अगर लग गया ये तो पूरा बदल देगा ना पूरा पूरा व्यवस्था को एकदम उल्टा ही कर देगा तो ये काफी मुश्किल होगा इसको करना एक कानून में लाना और इसको इंप्लीमेंट करना दोनों बहुत मुश्किल है मगर इसको कानून में भी अगर हम लाए इसका मतलब ये नहीं कि सब कुछ बदल जाएगा क्योंकि हमें मालूम ये भी है कि हमारे देश में कानून उतना मानते ही नहीं है न्यूनतम मजदूरी वाला कानून तो सरकार भी नहीं मानती तो कानून को मनाने के लिए क्या चाहिए और जो हम अभी देख रहे हैं सबसे जरूरी यही है कि महिलाओं के और बाकी जो घरेलू मजदूर हैं उनकी एसोसिएशन उनकी मोबिलाइजेशन यही सबसे जरूरी है so what i would like to highlight just at the end is that it's not just enough to have the law it's essential it's, and it's not going to be easy to get this law i promise you but it is essential but it is not enough because to implement this law and to ensure that we get the rights and dignity of workers we will have to have that pressure from below and that cannot happen without the mobilization and the association of workers it cannot happen unless we actually bring all workers together to fight for their rights and to recognize them as rights and not the gifts of employers a gift of the state so i think it's and that's why i am so happy isliye main itna khush hu ki hamari behne aaye hain kyunki aap se hi ye badlav aayegi aap log jab ikattha honge aap log jab associations mein unions mein milkar ye maang uthayenge और कहेंगे कि ये जो हक है ये हमारी हक ही है ये कोई मतलब दान नहीं है सरकार की या किसी एम्प्लॉयर की तो तभी ये बदलाव आ सकती है एंड आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू मैं फाइनली द चेंजेस लाइक दिस आर नॉट जस्ट गुड फॉर डोमेस्टिक वर्कर्स दम सेल्स दे आर एक्चुअली वेरी गुड फॉर सोसाइटी बिकॉज अ सोसाइटी इन विच द राइट ऑफ ऑल वर्कर्स आर रेकग्नाइज इज एक्चुअली अ बेटर सोसाइटी टू लिव इन and it's also better for employers because it is better to have transparent dealings where you are dealing on terms of mutual respect rather than in a very top down fashion it's better even to avoid cases of unfair accusation so it's better for employers and it's better for society and most of all it's better for all of us if we want to feel proud of the place that we live in and if we want to live with dignity we have to recognize the dignity of all the citizens around us if we want to be given dignity as workers we must recognize the dignity of every worker and especially the workers who work for us as well thank you very much Thank you, Professor Dr. Jayati Ghosh, for an inspiring and thought-provoking lecture. And I think you very rightly said that uh, all the elite and the middle, half middle uh, income group people have to make this change. For this change is better for the society. Abhi aapne Professor Dr. Jayati Ghosh ko suna. Less grander ne unhe invite kara tha baat karne ke liye, baatchit karne ke liye. Aur less ne aapko ye bhi bataya tha pehle ki. डॉक्टर जयंती घोष दुनिया की प्रमुख अर्थशास्त्रियों में से एक हैं वे जवाहरलाल नेहरू विश्वविद्यालय की अर्थशास्त्र की प्रोफेसर हैं और वहाँ उन्होंने कई पुस्तकें भी लिखी हैं कई लेख भी लिखे हैं और महिलाओं के अधिकारों से लेकर घरेलू कामगार के अधिकारों तक उन्होंने बहुत सारे पुस्तकों में और बहुत सारे न्यूज में उनका हर वक्त लिखाई आती रहती है और उनको बहुत सारे पुरस्कारों से भी सुसज्जित किया जा चुका है प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर जयंती घोष को और आपने सुना कि कैसे वो आपके अधिकारों की घरेलू कामगार के अधिकारों की बात कर रही थी प्रोफेसर जयंती घोष ने और लिस्क रांडे दो, दोनों ने आपसे एक कन्वेंशन 189 की भी बात करी जो आईएलओ की एक कन्वेंशन है जिसमें घरेलू कामगारों के अधिकारों की बात करी गई है और उन्होंने उन्हीं सब अधिकारों को आपको बताया भी अब एक छोटा सा प्रश्न उत्तर का एक सेशन है अगर आपके कुछ प्रश्न हो लिस्ट क्रांडे से या टेनिस टेमोर से या प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर जयती हो से तो मैं चाहूंगी कि आप वो प्रश्न पूछे नाउ वी विल हैव अ ब्रीफ क्वेश्चन एंड आंसर सेशन 
which will be moderated uh, by Ms. Liz Cranberry. And uh, we have mics in the audience. Uh, I would request you to kindly raise your hand. Uh, we can take a couple of questions and then uh, the panelists uh, would respond to them. Yes, please. Uh, my question is to Professor Ghosh. Uh, Ma'am, you talked about the, uh, the inclusion of uh, domestic work in the calculation of GDP. I wanted to ask because, because a year ago you came to LSR and you talked about this problem that it would increase the GDP, however it will not, not solve all the problems. So how fruitful will it be to, increase, uh, to, to include domestic work in the calculation of GDP? And secondly, Ma'am, at the uh, risk of sounding naive, what actually is stopping the government of India from ratifying this convention? Uh, if it is so widely recognized, why are we not doing it? Great question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. My question is, uh, when we are talking about domestic workers here, I, it is my own personal viewpoint, we haven't been able to give attention to the children of these domestic workers. Because when these people are working at our households, the children of these workers are exposed to every kind of abuse, whether it is sexual abuse, physical abuse, as well as emotional abuse. And emotional abuse is one of those social plagues we resist, we do not talk about. So I think we, there should be some kind of propaganda because law is not a complete solution to the situation. So therefore there should be some kind of a propaganda or public notification or somewhere through which we are actually making our public aware that the kids of such people also need certain kind of a protection. We'll take one more question from uh, the gentleman in the back. Uh, I'm Mitra. Uh, when uh, you said that 96% uh, growth on the unregulated sector in the domestic worker, uh, don't you think that uh, that technology uh, and information uh, uh, growth also has a certain percentage in the growth of domestic worker? Because when we see the domestic worker, the especially the female uh, domestic worker, they come up uh, because they they want uh, their family to be equipped with the latest technology like TV, mobile, etc. And for that purpose, they sometimes work. Uh, work more than the, their uh, male uh, counterparts to earn more and uh, reduce the gap. And uh, now I feel that there is a less uh, 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 difference between the male and female uh, domestic worker. Uh, thank you very much for these very good questions. No, no, uh, yeah. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, my oh. question... Yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, my question is that um, we in general are promoting the uh, capitalist system and then we are talking about uh, protection of the workers. When capitalism in itself involves exploitation and profit making, then how is uh, protection going to work hand in hand with capitalism? As in that is something which can't really work. Uh, that is We're going to allow the professor to answer these questions and we'll pick up the next round. Right, thanks very much. You know, you're absolutely right. I do not believe we should try and include unpaid work in GDP because that actually gives you a false sense of a higher income. But what I'm saying is that in fact, the, because we do not, because we look at only paid incomes, we do not recognize the social contribution. So this is a plea to move away from GDP as a measure of the human well-being and to actually look at the wider implications of human well-being and also the contribution of different activities in human well-being. So, uh, simply. So, in the question was that if we do this work that is without the weight of the work, if we put it in GDP, then what do we say? So, we say that we don't need to do this. But we have to see that the GDP is not all. जो हमारे अर्थव्यवस्था है उसमें हमें देखना है कि लोगों की हालत कैसी है और उसके हिसाब से जो घरेलू काम हो रहा है ये वो लोगों की हालत को सुधारने के लिए बहुत एक मूल बात है um, you're absolutely right about the children of domestic workers and I, I meant to talk about it and I'm sorry that I didn't but I, you know there is a discussion that is very important about the work of domestic workers 
at the unpaid work of domestic workers. Because just as I am able to be here today because someone is doing my work at home, well, I'm calling it my work when it isn't. That's the gender construction of society, right? It's actually unpaid work that should have been done by everybody in the household. But the point is that I am facilitated given the gender construction because someone else is doing my work. But she has to go home and do all of that. She has the double burden. And in addition, many of them, as you say, have to bring the children, have to expose them to all kinds of things. And I'm also very happy that you highlighted the point of emotional abuse. Because even in the most, um, shall we say, democratic, liberal-minded families, there is a significant amount of acceptance of inequality. And so very small children or children in very formative years are exposed to a very blatant inequality and very different senses of entitlement when they see the children of their employers living a very different lifestyle and treating them with an insensitivity, even in the most liberal households. So you're absolutely right to raise that point. उनकी हालत देखना उनके एक तो या तो अकेले घर में रहते हैं या साथ साथ जाते हैं काम पे जब काम पे जाते हैं उनके भी बहुत सारे कठिनाई होते हैं बहुत सारी मुश्किलें होते हैं उनके लिए भी हमें देखना है उनकी तरफ भी हमें ध्यान रखनी है मिस्टर um, मित्रा uh, talked about the fact that uh, women often work more so as to provide basically more consumer durables in the uh, economy. You know, that's absolutely true, yes. But it's a, shall we say, it's a household decision that, you know, certain things are desired. And it is also the fact that now there is a proliferation of uh, media that exposes everybody to the knowledge that there are all these things. And that in turn means that the household wants to do, uh, wants to have many things. And typically, yes, women will actually go out and work harder or go to more houses to work or do whatever they can to try and provide more. The fact that the, there are, the people in poverty are aspirational is not just um, you know, a fact of life, but it is desirable. But it is just that that aspiration must be recognized in terms of the rights of those workers to be treated with not just dignity, but with on equal terms in terms of wages and everything else, I think. Oh dear, darling, the capitalist system, you're absolutely right. Now, the trouble is, you know, I, I, that when I was your age, I would say, yes, we have to wait for the socialist revolution. I now want stuff even before that. <laughs> I want change <laughs> even before the socialist revolution, okay? And so I'm saying, yes, unfortunately, capitalism generates inequality, oppression, exploitation, I'm going to fight to preserve the rights of workers as much as possible within that. And maybe that itself is a form of revolution, you know? <laughs> we'll take the next round of questions, <laughs> ma'am. Yeah. Oh, thank you, uh, Jyoti. Yeah. Uh, as you know, I come from a conflict uh, region, Northeast India. I'm from Northeast Network. And I just want to tell you that when we talk with domestic workers, mm -hmm. I think they are all trying to get away out from the bondage. Yes. Yes. My question to you is about the trafficking that's going on. Mm. It's big business. Mm. When we try to work against it, we are also threatened about it. I want to know from you, uh, there is such a thin line between yeah. uh, women who are being sent out on domestic work legally, uh, even through consensus, and the trafficking that goes on and it's going to be abused further even if laws, even if ILO is able to influence the government. So could you in an academic forum be able to bring, highlight this out because when we do practical work like this uh, there is always a threat uh, that uh, you know we are, uh, uh, we are interfering uh, with the law and the police also are not so friendly about it. Thank you. We'll take three questions right here. The next, um, no, microphone goes right here. There's a, there's a young man there who's been... Okay, <laughs> and then we'll go yeah. back to him and then to yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Joana Vrabets. I am from Portugal. Actually, um, this is an issue very uh, 
you know, I did my heart because I'm doing uh, my doctoral studies precisely on domestic workers, a comparative study of Portugal and uh -huh. India. So I have to say um, it was wonderful to listen to you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for this wonderful <laughs> presentation. You're my new hero. <laughs> So I might be approaching you at the later stage. <laughs> For the moment, just a, a couple of uh, small remarks. Many, many years ago, um, actually a, a Portuguese uh, law professor was saying uh, in one of his uh, classes that who marries his, he would say cleaning lady, but now it's domestic worker, is not contributing to the growth of the GDP. So even yes. in the legal terms, it's this thing of, that you were mentioned so well between also the relations of who is working, who is paid, who is not paid. Mm -hmm. In Europe, um, there has been also a lot of new changes in this area. Until recently, I was the director of the Observatory on Trafficking in Human Beings in Portugal. And so we were working closely with several organizations and ILO too, in order to bring the issue of trafficking in human beings and domestic workers. Mm -hmm. In Europe, this issue has been raised especially related to diplomatic households. Mm. Because a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> sorry? <laughs> no, no, don't be sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> because this was identified, so there are several developments in identify and protect uh, domestic work workers that are brought from other countries by diplomats. And I'm not just referring to this Indian yeah. case, I'm saying in general, in mm -hmm. Europe, this has been more and more. And especially in countries very, I will finish in one sec, uh, countries in Austria, in France, mm -hmm. in uh, Belgium, where there is a huge diplomatic representation. So this is not just um, an issue from countries, developing countries, but also for all countries. Um, in what comes to gender, just want to mention that, uh, curiously, there is also huge gender inequality in domestic yes. workers. Because if you see most of the workers almost exclusively in the diplomatic households, they are men. So this is some mm. <laughs> small observation, but an issue. Mm. And the last but not the least, one of the things I was looking for was to have a copy of this in Hindi, but it doesn't exist. So actually, it will be a good initiative <laughs> to also to spread the word and make this accessible good to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to take two more questions this round. The gentleman back here and then the young man here. Hi, uh, Professor Chantrikos. Uh, thanks for a wonderful uh, lecture. I, as, as in your in your lecture also you have mentioned that the domestic the uh, number of domestic workers been increased uh, during the uh, past one decade, and you uh, mentioned specifically it's mainly because of the economic development and the uh, and the demand from the uh, middle middle class and upper middle class that they like. I would also like to draw a kind of attention that uh, in the recent past one decade. Uh, the lower middle class women also started going to out for work to meet the uh, increasing expenditure in the uh, daily uh, uh, life. So my doubt is that in this uh, and those uh, lower middle class family also has a huge demand for domestic workers because their women are going out for the work. And the economy is put this lower middle class woman or lower middle class family in such a dilemma that they cannot think beyond, uh, even they, are, they themselves are not getting a uh, living wage. Maybe they are getting a minimum wage, but they are not getting a living wage. So how could they uh, can think of giving a better or a minimum wage to a domestic worker they deploy in their families? Thank you. And we have one more question this round. Yeah. working conditions, a day of rest, living area, a rigid contract, which could require mm. a lawyer. All of this uh, requires a fair amount of money, mm. money that the middle class in general does not necessarily have. And, uh, and if the middle class cannot afford to hire domestic help, that leads to a lack of demand. And then the poor in general are, are also deprived of work. 
being a form of work, a less illegal form of work, and you are and and, and, and therefore you are putting both the middle class and the poor, a, a large segment of society in a lose lose situation. So in the practical model mm -hmm. for domestic uh, domestic self employment in India. Okay, I'm very glad you asked that question. Thank you. Um, you know, this issue uh, that both Ben and uh, my friend here raised about trafficking, I think, is a very important issue because there is, as I mentioned, it's a very thin line, and Ben reiterated, between voluntary movement and trafficking, especially when there is a lot of material insecurity. But that doesn't make the fact of trafficking any less horrific. But it is also the case that there are, as she mentioned, massive vested interests in trafficking. It's not something that you can address even at one point, at the point of departure, or even at the point of transit, or even at the point of arrival. And very often we know that this is linked not just with the underworld and with dawns and all the Bollywood style things, but with very established enterprises with very established employing employment agencies and so on. So it, I'm not denying that it is a very, very important problem. And I do believe that it is one of those things which again is understudied and underplayed in policy. So this is the trafficking thing, which is the most important thing. The most important thing is to go and to go अपनी इरादे से आना इसमें बहुत यू नो ये दोनों मिल भी जाते हैं कभी-कभी बहुत गरीब घरों में मगर इसकी बात मतलब ये नहीं है कि ट्रैफिकिंग के बाद जो बहुत दुर्व्यवस्था है वो मानना चाहिए मगर ये बात सही है कि जो ट्रैफिकिंग चल रही है उसमें बहुत सारे इंटरेस्ट्स हैं और ये इंटरेस्ट्स के साथ लड़ना मुश्किल काम है इसीलिए इस पे बहुत ज्यादा और काम भी होना चाहिए और इस, इसको लेकर हमें और आवाज भी उठानी चाहिए बहुत ज्यादा से द पॉइंट दैट यू नो व्हेन यू मैरी योर इन फैक्ट देयर वाज द फेमस आई थिंक वाज समबडी हु सेड द 19th सेंचुरी व्हेन यू मैरी योर हाउस कीपर यू यू द जीडीपी फॉल्स एंड योर your professor said the same thing uh, it's uh, it's right but i think i'm going to take that along with this this boy's question because i you know there is an issue here but the other point you mentioned about gender inequality is so true and i should have raised that also you know the wage data tells us even in india women domestic workers get half the wage of male domestic workers on average scheduled caste scheduled tribe domestic workers get around one third less than gender category or caste domestic workers so all other social discriminations also come into play in this aspect of even the wages and the conditions of domestic work. Um, the issue of, um, you know, the fact that low middle class women are uh, entering the job market and as you said that, you know, what you will do is deprive, that if you put such good conditions on employment, you will actually reduce the possibility of the middle class and others accessing domestic work. So let's just try and unpackage this a little bit. What are we saying? We are saying that a certain category of the population must be able to outsource these basic household responsibilities to others. But of course the poor are never going to be able to outsource it. The people who are providing it are obviously never going to be able to outsource it. They will continue to do both. They will share the double burden. Is that the best way of looking at it? Supposing we want actually to ensure that every household in the country has access to certain minimum things. The most obvious thing is social provision, okay? And that's, by the way, the, the Scandinavian model. The Nordic countries did that. They said we will have social provision of the basics, which is to say, you know, creches for children, proper looking after of old people, proper facilities for the care of the sick, and many, many labor-saving devices. In other words, what we should really do is ensure public provision of many things that can be outsourced so that everybody can access them. Why should we stop at the line and say only the lower middle class can access someone to look after their children? What happens below that when they're just working class, which is still, by the way, 90% of the population? What happens even below that? Or do we want everyone to be able to access daycare facilities, care of the sick, care of the old, and so on. Similarly, do we want the drudgery of household work or do we want to ensure that it's minimized as much as possible? With labor-saving devices, with more outsourcing, with more of that stuff being able to be purchased and so on. And if we want that, 
then we must be demanding that social provision. We are not demanding it. Why? Because we, the middle classes and upper classes, we can hire people to do it. But if we recognize that this is a right of all families, we will be demanding the social provision. And by the way, it's not, don't fall for that nonsense that they tell you that we're too poor a country, we can't afford it. Because countries at much lower levels of per capita GDP did this, and it can become a way of growing. Okay? Finland was a very poor country when it did universal social protection of these kinds of things. I mean, these were very poor developing, Ecuador is a very poor developing country which is trying to institute universal uh, social services of all of these things. So you can do it at low levels of income, you need the political will. So we have to stop thinking of access to these services as something that is still, you know, for a minority. So, okay, 10%, 20%, 25%, okay? We have to make it available to everybody, including everybody in this room. Which means you have to have the public provision, you have to have the labor saving devices, and final, you have to see domestic work as not just the preserve of the women. It has to be shared. <laughs> we will take one final round of questions. I have the young woman here. We'll take a point in the back. Which are truly inspiring. Uh, one question. In the recent past, there has been a growth in the agencies who offer you such services. And uh, from what experiences personally I have, uh, the domestic workers are coming, they have been, uh, you know, widely exploited by these uh, agencies. And even the employers come and share the experiences of being exploited by these agencies. So do you think there is an emerging sense that, you know, such agencies should also be, you know, there's some legal implications to them? And also there, if there are coming up some light, some kind of license or, you know, a check or balance to these agencies, if you could just answer, that would be very helpful. Thank we you. We have a question in the back and then a question here, and unfortunately that will be it for today. Ma'am. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, my name is Tripti Lahiri. Uh, I'm a uh, journalist. I'm working on uh, domestic work uh, in depth this year. My name is Tripti Lahiri. I'm a journalist. I wanted to ask you, one thing that can come, it will be about the veteran and all these things. But there are many kinds of things that are cultural. Like the domestic worker can use the bathroom. Or the different plates, etc. से खा सकते हैं जैसे जो ग्लास पूरा उनका एम्प्लॉयर इस्तेमाल करता है नहीं इस्तेमाल कर सकते हैं। So basically my question is those practices, you know, not being able to use the bathroom that the employer has in their house, are those things to be addressed by law or in some other way? How do those practices change? My second question is drivers to some extent seem to have some of the more formal things, even if you you know they may not be treated very well, but they have over time, the concept is there, um, a certain amount of fixed hours. Um, so my question with that is, why is that the driver has a little bit of stuff that they have, like over time, and the ones who work in the house, they don't have this. And the final question, sir. I'm so sorry, I can't hear you. No, wait, we, we'll get the mic. I'm sure that we'll have that one. Yeah. And, uh, back I do appreciate it. No, your if ideas. you hold it like this, we can hear you. Your ideas are very good. And you also, during your uh, speech, you invited associations to, you know, support this community. Yeah. Uh, the, there are associations uh, willing to come forward, but are we protected by the ILO and UN? Because we have not signed as such uh, the, as you brought out. Legally, associations are not well protected. They are equally vulnerable like this community if they involve to educate and, uh, you know, support this community. 
that's really a question for the two of you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the issue of agencies exploiting, absolutely right. Sorry, uh, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. Ma I'm not talking about the agencies they are commissioned. No, no, I understand. I'm talking about uh, association. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, you I, can. I'm more That's right. I, I agree. I, I was just taking that question first. You're absolutely right. And by the way, this is something recognized in the ILO convention as well. That these placement agencies, recruitment agencies, and so on have to be regulated. So they have to be registered, they have to be monitored, they have to be regulated. Absolutely, no question about it. That, that's essential. You know, this point you raised is so true. And it's one of those things which it doesn't come in the convention because I think in India we are unique in our very complicated and subtle forms of hierarchy and discrimination. We must be world leaders in, you know, in inequality of that kind. We are so good at different kinds of hierarchy and that is because of our unfortunate legacy of the caste system, I believe, which has created a social tolerance for in immense inequality which is astounding. Again, I believe that this is something that you can't legislate. I mean, of course, you should legislate, but you can't legislate because it has to do with day-to-day -day activities that need uh, a different kind of awareness. Once again, I think, you know, social provision is essential because that's the kind of place where you, you cannot really afford to discriminate. So if you have a common crash, you would actually be in a position where you can't say this, this uh, plate for this child and that food for that person or this bathroom only for this group and so on. It is, a, it is a process of awareness building that will take a very long time, but I don't think it is something you could do through legislation. It is something that would have to come partly through, I would believe, mobilization from below and partly through a much greater extent of social provision which forces groups to come together in a way that otherwise we are very resistant to. But you are right in raising it, it is a very, very complicated and terrible problem. Why are drivers better? Because they are semi-skilled, you have to learn, well you have to be literate for sure, you have to have a driving license and because let's face it, they are all men. Huh? Uh, there is no reason by the way, I drive a car pretty well, much better than my husband. हमारे देश में बहुत चलती है जैसे अलग प्लेट और कप या अलग बाथरूम इस्तेमाल करना ये ऐसे बहुत सारे जो छोटे छोटे मामले होते हैं इसको बदलने के लिए कानून काफी नहीं है इसको बदलने के लिए मन को बदलना पड़ेगा मन को बदलने के लिए क्या कर सकते हैं हम एक तो मैं कह रही हूँ नीचे से आवाज उठाना इसके अलावा बहुत कुछ नहीं बदलता है और सरकारी तरफ से चीजें देना मतलब सरकारी तरफ से सुविधाएं देना पढ़ाने बच्चों के की देखभाल के लिए बच्चों को पढ़ाने के लिए बीमारों की देखभाल के लिए वगैरह वगैरह तो ये जो है ये एक बहुत कॉम्प्लिकेटेड सवाल है हमारे समाज में विशेषकर क्योंकि हम तो ये जातिवाद की वजह से हम ये बहुत ये सारे जो चीजें हैं ना हम इसके वर्ल्ड एक्सपर्ट हैं फिर भी हमें लगता है कि ये बदल सकती है क्योंकि जैसे ही आवाज बहुत उठेगी यहाँ से आप लोगों से भी और और भी जैसे ये बहुत सारे बच्चे आए हुए हैं ये जब बड़े होंगे ये भी अलग तरीके की बातें करेंगे इनकी सोच भी अलग होगा और जैसे ही सरकार की तरफ से ये मानना हो जाएगा कि ये यूनिवर्सल होना चाहिए ये सर्वजनिक होना चाहिए सबको सबको मिलने चाहिए ये सुविधाएं तभी ये बदलाव आ सकती है मुझे लगता है uh, sir, I think that, that um, in a sense, your last um, question about association comes to that. Yes, association is difficult. Yes, it's very easy for me to say it, surrounded in the comforting embrace of two very progressive UN agencies. But you know, 
I think that is the great thing about India that however much is terrible, we really have a very vibrant democracy which is vibrant in very unexpected ways. Right. So I'm hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> We are at the end of our public lecture. We would like to invite Tine, the very dynamic head of the International Labor Organization, to give a final vote of thanks. Good morning and namaskar. It's been a wonderful morning here at the Scope. Let me address uh, all of you as the chairperson of the UN task team on employment and social protection as well as the director of the ILO as well as an employer of domestic workers. Um, Lise Grant, my friend, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for making it, uh, making the ILO convention and the domestic workers' rights issue a UN issue. It uh, is definitely an issue that we all uh, are behind and thank you for your strong words at the beginning. Um, Professor Gayati Ghosh, thank you for your extremely inspiring lecture on invisible workers. Today, they are very visible in this room and uh, we are very happy that uh, you also spoke in Hindi so that uh, the message and the insights that you bring to this important issue is reaching out. Um, while you unpack the challenges, uh, both in terms of uh, invisible workers' contribution to the economy of India, you also highlighted and called for deep behavioral change. And these are uh, very uh, difficult issues, but I think you gave a lot of insight and thoughts that hopefully we will take uh, with us. Let me now thank uh, each and everyone in this room. Um, let me thank um, the uh, domestic workers in particular. Uh, you are the reason why we are gathered here today. You are the reason why many of us can do the job, as we do, as uh, Professor uh, Ghosh said. So on behalf of the working women and men, which actually also include you because you have a double burden. I'd like to thank all the domestic workers uh, who are here today and also those who are not here, <laughs> who could not be here because they are in different homes carrying out their work. Um, let me just state once again the simple fact that domestic work stands as um, the employment option for millions of women in India. We are looking at an emerging sector here. We are looking at one of the sole entry points for women to enter the labor market, and that's why it's so crucial. Secondly, it's extremely crucial to look at both the practical aspects in our daily lives as well as the policy work. Uh, Professor Gorsh highlighted the national policy it has been consulted with different states. The consultation process on the text has been done. It is in the cabinet of ministers. But we still need to keep up the momentum. It's a very important uh, policy. And hopefully, when and if the policy is uh, adopted, we will also see a move towards the ILO uh, convention. Now, uh, Lise has already mentioned the ILO uh, convention uh, in detail, and uh, the fact that we are talking about decent work means that not any job is a good job. I'd like to leave that also with our domestic workers today, and to tell you that your job, with, with your job, you are a worker, you have rights, and the rights have been very uh, vividly uh, discussed uh, by Jayati Ghosh. Uh, finally, um, let me say that um, when we are talking about the workplace in this particular area, it's the private home and it makes it more difficult to sort of know what's going on. I would like to urge every one of us, every one of you in the room, to talk. We call it in ILO, social dialogue. It's about dialogues. Maybe, maybe all 
you need to do as domestic workers. Maybe you do have employers who will gladly listen to your concerns. Maybe they just don't know. Maybe you don't know enough. You need to get more awareness. Um, and so do we as employers. We need to know uh, what the rights are for domestic workers. So let me end by saying that and also saying that we know that there are good practices out there. And we will also make an effort to highlight the good practices where domestic workers are working in a home where there is a real employment relationship. Thank you everyone for coming here today and for asking some excellent questions. And uh, hopefully this is the beginning of a movement. Uh, and we will uh, be working with you in a number of the areas you're mentioning, not just the ILO. I know that there are a number of UN agencies who are working on issues such as trafficking uh, with the ILO, but uh, uh, also uh, separately. And we will do our very best to have a coordinated and focused approach so that we can help bring the dignity to the domestic workers in India. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tine. Uh, Tine uh, Stemos, Antarashi Mazdur Sanke, Dakshin Asia, Deshoki, or Bharat Ki Nideshika, Unko Apne Abhisuna, Unone Apsapka, the Nevat Kiahe, or the Nevat Kiahe, Liz Granka, Grandeka, Jinone, Ejo, Grelu Kamgar, Kajamuda, Arts Sapke Samne, one UN Kitarase, Arts Samne Rakha, or Sari United Nations Agencies, Arts Milke. Uh, अधिकारों की बात कर रही है महिला कामगारों के लिए uh, uh, ने डोमेस्टिक वर्कर्स पॉलिसी के बारे में भी दो तीन शब्द कहे उन्होंने कहा कि वो पॉलिसी अभी कैबिनेट में पेंडिंग uh, है अभी पास नहीं हुई है अभी पारित नहीं हुई है uh, अगर वो पारित होती है तो उस uh, उसमें जो महिलाओं के हक है जो दिए गए हैं घरेलू कामगार महिलाओं के उससे बहुत जल्दी ये कोशिश भी की जाएगी कि जो आईएलओ की कन्वेंशन 189 जिसके बारे में डॉक्टर जयती घोष ने भी बताया और लिस क्रेंडे ने भी बताया आप सबको और जो मूल अधिकार जो घरेलू कामगार के हैं वो कहीं ना कहीं लीगल रूप से न्यायिक रूप से आप सबको मिलेंगे और उन्होंने टीने ने ये भी बात कही कि आईएलओ में हम एक शब्द का इस्तेमाल करते हैं सोशल डायलॉग सोशल डायलॉग का मतलब है आपस में बातचीत करना तो आज उन्होंने जो यहां पे घरेलू कामगार हैं उनको और जो उनके जिनके यहां वो नौकरी करती हैं उन दोनों को ये कहा कि आप लोग आज दूसरे से बातचीत करिए बातचीत करने से सब सहन सुजल सुलझती है बातचीत करने से आपके जो अधिकार हैं आपके एम्प्लॉयर को आपके मालिक को समझ में आएंगे और आप जब लोग बात करेंगे दोनों आपस में तो कुछ ना कुछ समस्या का समाधान भी होगा धन्यवाद टीमें नाउ वी वुड ऑल रिक्वेस्ट यू टू kindly join us for lunch uh, which is being served outside this hall uh, and as you leave towards the lunch hall I would also request you to kindly spend few minutes to see a very unique display of comics rights outside the United Nation in India in partnership with World Comics India uses the power of comics to sell stories from across India across communities and across languages and through different workshops held in the country, people who are poor and marginalized victims of violence and domestic workers find expression through comics. So I would request you to kindly enjoy this very unique display of comics which is just outside this hall. I am lunch this hall किताबें भी हैं, कॉमिक्स भी हैं, जिनका एक एक्सिबिशन लगाया गया है। मैं चाहूँगी जब आप हॉल की तरफ जा रहे हो खाने के लिए, तो उन कॉमिक्स और उन एक्सिबिशंस को जरूर देखिएगा, आपको बहुत ही पसंद आएगा। धन्यवाद।